This is the Steel Report. This week on the Steel Report, we expand our discussion on farming in Iowa. $72 billion impact on Iowa's economy. In fact, more than a quarter of Iowa's entire economy relies on agriculture. Our panel discussion resumes right now as we begin our show. This is a News 7 KWWL special report. Growing forward, the future of farming in Iowa. Right now on the Steel Report, welcome to our program as we continue our recent discussion following up on our one hour farming special. We have our guests who agreed to stick around a little bit longer following our recent discussion. Abby's here with me today, so let's begin with our introduction of our panelists. Abby, right away. Yeah, we'll introduce this panel of farmers and ag officials here in Iowa. Next to me is Kate Edwards. Kate runs Wildwoods Farm. It's a CSA community supported agriculture farm in Johnson County. Kate is also a member of the Eastern Iowa Young Farmers Coalition. Next, we have Sally Hollis. Sally is really a well-known and respected Black Hawk County farmer, owner of Lane Haven Farms, owned and operated by the Hollis family for three generations, along with her husband, Blake, and Kurt and Betty Hollis. They produce seed corn, commercial corn, soybeans, and hogs. Right next to Sally is Jim Greif. Many of you will recognize him. He is the president of the Iowa Corn Growers Association. Jim is a corn and soybean farmer in Lynn County. He has been farming for 41 years now, and he is also the owner of Prairie View Ag Service. Also with us today, we're privileged to have with us Iowa Ag Secretary Mike Nag. The secretary is a crop and livestock farmer himself, way out there in Cylinder, Iowa, on Northwest right. Iowa, where he grew up. We thank him for making the trip to Waterloo to be a part of our program recently. And of course, on the Steel Report here today, and Secretary Nag, on our earlier program, we talked about your recent trip to Japan right. and how important it is to have that market really kind of back online. Where do you go after Japan? What's the next big market export country, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, we, we focused a lot on China the last year or so mm -hmm. and, and how big of a hole that creates when we lose that market. And, uh, you know, it's hard to go find another China, but what we know we need to do is go hit some singles and doubles, maybe, to use mm -hmm. a, uh, a baseball analogy. And there's lots of markets get around the base, world. Get least. on base. Yeah, yeah. Make it, you know, <laughs> uh, get, get a few runs here. But, you know, uh, we had a trade mission to uh, Colombia and Panama earlier this year. Great opportunity mm -hmm. to expand. We have free trade agreements there. Of course, Canada and Mexico. I'll say it one more time. Pass the USMCA. <laughs> uh, very, very important to us. But, you know, there are, there are places around the world, Korea, uh, Taiwan, lots of places that we can go and expand on the uh, exports that we're already uh, conducting today or using today, and so uh, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. But we need to get the ball rolling mm -hmm. here. Japan was good news, USMCA critically important. Hopefully we can build that into momentum and secure a deal that is comprehensive and enforceable with China. Right. Kate, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about your work with the Eastern Iowa Young Farmers Coalition. What is the hardest part right now for young farmers to get into the business? I know you and I have had a chance to talk a little bit mm -hmm. about how zoning with your CSA model has yes. made it very difficult. So one of the things that's really difficult for all farmers is land access. One of the unique things about a direct market farmer is that you don't need a lot of land in order to make a living. So that's wonderful, but there are some um, counties that have gone further than um, the state has allowed them to um, and to doing um, using some outdated um, zoning laws that don't actually apply to smaller acreages of ground um, and so one of the things is the state has a, a state enacted exemption that says that all farmers are exempt from zoning laws and this is important from an economic standpoint because um, it's both an economic and an access standpoint because if you are a young farmer um, the USDA will um, lend you a certain amount of money, but that will only buy a certain amount of land. And so even people who are coming into family operations, this can be a problem in a succession planning situation where they want to buy small acreages over time to add up to their, their larger operation. And there's some counties that are um, going further than they should from state law in terms of um, how they're, they're looking at that um, zoning exemption. And so one of the things that we're doing um, from the Eastern Iowa Farming Coalition is we started realizing that just, um, we weren't the only ones, that there are farmers all over Iowa that are facing this in different pockets. And so we kind of came together and started talking to our legislators and saying, is there something we can do about this? So um, we have some, some things in the works to try to, to try to solve this and have some legislator support because um, it's needed to have um, ways in for, for young people into agriculture. I just know that on our farm we really uh, have found young people to have a lot of energy mm -hmm. and we have mm -hmm. students from Hawkeye Community College, from UNI, from Iowa State, some high school students that work on the farm. Mm -hmm. And a number of those did grow up on a farm, but not all of them. Mm -hmm. And in addition, you know, we partner with school districts where schools bring their students 
to the farm for a tour or being an advocate, advocate for ag I think is important. Um, so I think as you talked about reaching out into different channels to try to reach those students. Places we don't always tip traditionally go, right? Yes, there are a lot of opportunities to just share about all the different careers in agriculture and get people excited because it is exciting and there's a lot of opportunity. That's and amazing. That's a wonderful way into yeah. agriculture is working on someone's farm. I, mm -hmm. you know, a number of people who've worked on my farm have gone on to start their own farms and mm -hmm. every year it's fun you know, when I get uh, new recruits, so to speak, on the, on the farm crew. It's amazing um, what people are capable of who didn't grow up on farms be, even though they because they, they have a passion for it and they're right. willing to learn. So they may not know on the on day one how to help you back up a trailer, but you know <laughs> the, by the end of the season they'll, they'll help you and right. learn those things. I'm always amazed at how many people actually lease uh, their farm to other farmers or vice versa. Me don't have to actually own the land anymore. I mean, what's your situation, Sally? Do you own all the land or do you lease it? Do you? Uh, how Wait. does that work? I mean, I mean, it's personal, so you don't have to answer. <laughs> you know, it, but, uh, it's okay. Yeah. I think a lot of farmers today, um, yes, they own some of their land, but they're also most farmers are leasing and renting land right. as well, and it's a combination. And so, I think. Uh, What's really fun about being here with, with this panel is farmers love to get together. <laughs> and, and we love to get together and share stories and share you know, what's going on and how are we handling it. And I think uh, that's part of agriculture. And so like a young, I didn't grow up on a farm either. And I remember uh, when my oldest son, you know, one day, it's just in his blood, and he came home from first grade, and he was so upset because he was not learning anything about farming. Oh. <laughs> And yeah. as I thought about that, I think once, even if you didn't grow up on a farm, once you've been there and you've experienced it, it just gets in your blood. It does, and yeah. um, now it's in my blood. And yeah. so I think uh, we just have to get more people exposure mm -hmm. and experiences. What do you tell your, the people a part of Iowa Corn about what we need to do to attract more people, to expand our markets? What, what is your biggest concern? Well, we need, we need markets, obviously. We, we need to be sustainable. We have to have markets that uh, cover our costs at least. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that farming's in your bloods. I think it's more in your, it's a genetic defect maybe. <laughs> uh, it, it's in our genes. I mean, if you it was born on a farm, you're, you're gonna uh, obviously want to farm. We have people that want to come out and, and uh, you know, bring their kids out and actually run the farm well. Today, the technology doesn't let anybody just get in a tractor and run it when you got to sit there and wait for satellites to lock on before a thing will drive itself across the field. It's a little more uh, involved than just jumping in a 4020 and driving. But uh, we need sustainable markets that we can depend on. That's why uh, we'll go back to the RFS. We thought we had something there that was going to use up a billion plus bushels of corn and it basically got taken away from us. Uh, those kind of deals we don't need and we shouldn't put up with. You were really hot about that, I know. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> to say the least, yeah. I mean, it, the law is the law. I mean, yeah. some people should, uh, especially the federal government, should follow the rules that they set, and uh, they didn't. You know, when we did the live uh, portion of the show, we were, were able to talk a lot about RFS and also the USMCA. Mm. The one thing we weren't able to touch um, as much upon is the uh, trade battle with China right now. So, Secretary Ning, let's talk more about that. As you're out and about, because you're out about in the state all the time, are you finding that farmers are still hanging on with the president on this? Well, yeah, I think that, that China is a little different from the other, you know, the other markets that we're talking about, certainly USMCA and Japan, in that what we need here is a comprehensive, really a fundamental shift in, in the relationship with China. I mean, we're talking about intellectual property theft over the years that is hundreds of billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, to just think that the Chinese are going to stop doing that tomorrow is, is and that we can enforce it, uh, is, is something that's going to take some time. And so it's a big market for us. There's no doubt about it. We would like to get back to where we're selling soybeans and, and pork mm -hmm. like we were. But you know what? We should have been selling more uh, poultry and corn and DDGs and ethanol. So we, it's not just good enough to go back to what we had. Mm -hmm. They were blocking a lot of those products with uh, non-tariff barriers. In fact, they just opened, reopened for poultry last mm -hmm. week. Right. And that is something that should have happened years ago. And so they have used those kinds of uh, non-tariff barriers to their advantage and, and our disadvantage for many years. So I think farmers understand that. Now, we're all anxious. We're all mm -hmm. wishing that this was over many, many months ago. But I think you would find a lot of folks who would say it's worth trying to get mm -hmm. to a good deal. 
Uh, there's some inter interesting things happening with, with China too now that with African swine fever impacting them like it is, they need pork, they need protein. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that may shift the dynamic just a little bit in terms of uh, their willingness or their interest in getting a deal done. Yeah, and Sally, you raise hogs, so what are your yes. thoughts on that? It's definitely been frustrating uh, as a hog producer. Mm -hmm. uh, the African swine fever has been devastating to the uh, hog herd in China. And the, the U.S. production of hogs, um, they've lost that same amount of pork. And so wow. the amount of lost opportunity in terms of markets and what the United States could have sold to China um, is astronom astronomical. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think hog producers see um, a lot of opportunity. They also make sure that they're doing everything from a biosecurity to protect the health of the U.S. hog herd. Uh, but there's a lot of opportunity with that China market. Yeah, the biosecurity, when I was out at the Schneider farm, I mean, you could only go so far, and you had to be totally disinfected, or you could no, go no further. I mean, that's because the, the disease prevention is so, absolutely so critical. We'll continue our panel discussion on Iowa farming in just a moment. Welcome back. Right now, we're going to continue our discussion with our expert panel on Iowa farming. So I have a question right now. We talk a lot about mental health just in general, but mm -hmm. let's focus on farmers' mental health. We've read a lot of reports about mm -hmm. this. Uh, Secretary Nag, uh, kind of to you, you know, last year Iowa lost more than 80 dairy farms. That's not to say that those farmers committed suicide, but it does raise the alarm about how hard and stressful yep. it is to maintain a farm. So what resources are available for anyone out there watching that is struggling right now with mental health? Look, this is, this is a concern, and, you know, we're... In agriculture, we tend to be bootstrap people, right? But well, if you pulled your bootstraps off, what do you do? And, uh, and I think for the first thing that we need to make sure we're all conveying is that it is okay. It is okay to ask for help. Mm -hmm. It is okay to tell somebody that you're, you're, you're stressed or that you have some concerns. And, and that is, we, we've got to get past that stigma of asking for help. And so that really requires all of us. In, in every phase, you know, all the, all the grower groups and all the organizations and everything that we can do to, to make sure we're sending that message. Do Iowa banks and lenders, do they play a role in this? What role do they play? I mean, obviously, you have to have operating capital, That's and, right. uh, but they need to be paid, too. That's right. Oh, absolutely. That's an essential part of what we do, right? <laughs> Access to capital. You can ask each one of these folks uh, here at the, at the mm. desk uh, how important that conversation is with the bank. And, and again, um, times are tight and uh, those conversations really are happening now as we come into the end of the year uh, what about what about capital what about operating for next year so uh, they're they're a huge component to that of what makes us successful our agribusinesses as well extending credit and also uh, their access to capital so this puts a crunch on the whole uh, the whole system Sally I can tell you had something <laughs> to add to this yeah I, I do uh, I'm fortunate to serve on the board of directors for mm -hmm. Lincoln Savings Bank here locally one of the largest ag a very Iowa, large yes, egg huh? lender. And I just encourage all farmers to really uh, view them as somebody who's there to help them. As, as a, you know, our lenders are very good at working with farmers and they can be a consultant. And some yes. people view that maybe bank sometimes as an adversary, I feel like. And I think that that is a real partner for farmers. Um, so partner with your, with your banks and your financial institutions. And they have a lot of information to help farmers. We could see some of these, this tightening coming, right? Mm -hmm. And so the fact, that I, the fact is that most folks have been working with their lender for, for years now mm -hmm. to, uh, to restructure or whatever they need to do to make sure they have the operating capital that they need. Now, again, you can only do that for so long, but I, I totally agree that this is, this is important to be having these conversations the earlier the better if, if, there's, if there's trouble. And back to that mental health thing, I think it's really important for people to realize it's not your fault. Mm -hmm. If you're in a financial situation mm -hmm. that's hard, um, we have changing, um, we have hard weather right now, we have things with the trade agreements, there's things that are outside people's control and really realizing that it's not your fault I think is one of the first steps to realizing that it's gonna be okay. Well, let's move a little bit. Um, let's talk about some of the optimistic things that are happening, like say for Iowa corn, you've got a great message out there uh, that we mentioned during the live program about Iowa grows corn, but Corn Grows, grows Iowa, Iowa, and that's your slogan. And that is uh, our new slogan, so yes. moving ahead with Iowa corn, Jim, what, what do you see as a future here? Well, I see, uh, obviously, I think there's potential out there for markets. Uh, like Mike said, there's there maybe not home runs, but uh, we have countries that we've hardly tapped yet, like India. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about China is big. India's going to be bigger, you know, and they need oh. ethanol. Uh, they, they really do need ethanol. Uh, air quality in the world is kind of 
going downhill and that's one bright spot for corn growers is ethanol is a nice clean fuel and it, it really cleans up the air like in China. Uh, they've uh, been to China several times and they are embracing ethanol to clean up their air. Uh, the air in China is really bad and, and they need a clean fuel and they've figured that out. So I think the ethanol market, the biofuel market is a bright spot in agriculture. Uh, obviously, uh, the world needs food, so uh, corn is a staple uh, that you know we can grow livestock anywhere in the world with it. So, uh, but uh, in our even the corn growers would just as soon export pork or poultry or beef, mm -hmm. and, and uh, as a value-added product. But uh, it's uh, corn is going to be needed in the near future and far beyond. You know, we talked a little bit about this in the live program, Sally, we were talking about that food additive for uh, hogs, mm -hmm. the ractopamine. ractopamine. It's been around since about 1997, getting approval here in the United States, but it's banned in China. But you mentioned a lot of the big producers now, like Tyson, I believe, even they're welcoming that be that to hog without that additive, right? Yeah. They're not just welcoming it, they're asking for they're it. They're asking for it. Great. They're asking okay. for it or requiring it in some cases. And I think that's uh, just a change in consumer demand and mm -hmm. it's the right time and uh, for markets, uh, the right thing that we need to do in the industry. So that presents really an opportunity for a lot of hogs to go to China if, if the right deal can be worked out. Yeah. Well, absolutely. And again, with, uh, with, with China's hog industry being impacted like it is with, uh, with African swine fever, they need protein. They need protein mm -hmm. uh, in the, look, well, pork's an important staple in their diet you know they they use the price of pork to as part of measuring their total economic output mm -hmm. you know so it's a big deal uh, and so there's an opportunity there to import protein into into China and again I there's a, a sense of frustration that there is pork going to China but there could be more mm -hmm. and uh, we are missing some opportunity there uh, that we hope we hope can be resolved here in a phase one agreement and there's also some beans going to China too that's kind of little known right now or well they're making some purchases yeah. and sometimes we're not always yeah. sure that those purchases translate <laughs> into bushels on no. boats but no. but uh, I think again there's reason there's lots of reasons to be hopeful and there's the signals are being sent that that uh, this thaw is is real mm -hmm. But we all want to see something on paper uh, yeah. that, that's meaningful. Um, mm -hmm. I grew up in suburban Ohio. I learned about agriculture because I started working at an ag network. So I just started researching. Just like for today, I just started researching because there's so much information. So for the non-farmer that's watching right now, what's something you, what do you want them to know about the world of farming? You know, not only that the future is exciting, but what should they know? I think that farming is accessible, um, that you can know your farmer. Um, you can seek out a direct market farmer to know where those things that you can produce locally, but you can also um, meet your other neighborhood farmers that would love to meet you and understand what they're, um, what they're growing. Um, so I think that, that farming is accessible and that also that we, um, all farmers, um, really care about um, the soil and water and want to see um, see a, um, a sustainable environment. And I think one of the things that is really true in farming is it's consumer driven. And so if consumers want to see a certain future in farming, they get to choose how they spend their food dollar. And I think that that provides an awesome opportunity for, um, for consumers to quote, vote with their food dollars we've heard, um, but also for farmers to have new markets because consumers are asking for new things. Does Iowa's ag economy, all you guys, do you need to be one voice together can you be on your own? Are you stronger as united? How's that, I think all how's farmers that, get along pretty well. How's that working out? <laughs> well, we, we all get along. Okay. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, take the Farm Bureau, for instance. They represent the first time I went to a Farm Bureau National Convention. I'm from Iowa, the big corn state. You know, mm -hmm. I had a pretty good chip on my shoulder. But uh, you go to a convention down south somewhere, and there's tobacco farmers. There's uh, crayfish farmers. Uh, I mean, and and we all do get along. I mean, we have little petty feuds between mm -hmm. the corn and the soybean people, and even Iowa and Illinois. My wife's from Illinois, so we have I think a those ongoing. Are mostly jokes, aren't yeah, they? they're mostly <laughs> jokes, but we all uh, get along. We'll continue our discussion on farming in Iowa in just a moment. And welcome back as we wrap up our program this week, talking about farming in Iowa with our special panel, including Ag Secretary Mike Nag. To, to kind of build on this idea that, you know, we, we like to talk a lot about how much we produce in agriculture, right? But really, what are we doing here? We're, we're, we're feeding people. We're, we're fueling 
people's lives. We're, we're you know, providing clothing for people. You know, there's, there's a very human element to what we're doing here. It's not just about bushels and pounds of things. And I think we need to do a better job in agriculture about connecting those dots from production and what we do on the farm to what does it mean to a consumer? What does it mean in terms of food and nutrition and health? And uh, that's a great conversation that right. needs to be had. We need to get together over more meals and, and talk about those things. It's not about, hey, we in agriculture need to educate somebody outside of agriculture. Let's have a conversation. What, what are the questions that you really have? Uh, how do you have a discussion about those things? I think that's where we need to go, is, is uh, engage in that kind mm -hmm. of uh, conversation. And that, that's how we'll make progress between maybe farm and, and non-farm or ag and non-ag folks uh, you know, here in Iowa and across the country. I agree. I think that's, uh, I had a girlfriend who was on Leadership Iowa and heard you speak and, and she said, oh, I have all kinds of questions for you. <laughs> good. <laughs> Wonderful. Good. Uh, I have another friend who, uh, he'll email me articles and say, what do you think about mm -hmm. this? What's, what's really going on? And those are the conversations that really, mm -hmm. uh, meeting farmers and interacting and just, uh, I think, all farmers are trying to do a good job and be responsible, and there are challenges there in just trying to share what our goals are and what our challenges are and how everybody can help make it better. And I think also along that thing, one of the conversations we have is about water quality and other things, and mm -hmm. that um, we can't just expect the farmers um, to clean up all of what we need to clean up. It needs to be a, a shared responsibility right. because we're all eating. And so even though producers are the ones producing it, they're producing what the consumer has wanted. And so as we think about sustainability, things like that, it's a, it's a collective conversation among consumers and farmers to make sure we're choosing the future that we want. That's a great point. When you mentioned water quality, uh, you know, I travel some and I sit in airports and you'll strike up a conversation with somebody and you'll tell them you're a farmer. And, and even to this day, the American, American Gothic picture, you know, is kind of what they stereotype everybody from right. Iowa as. And so you start talking about water quality and the things we're doing. And, you know, my well is in my farm and I'm not going to do something to pollute my own water. Right. I, I, I can't use the term I normally would use here on the air. But, uh, just the same, we take care of our water and our soil and, and, you know, we use cover crops and whatnot. So, and then the technology thing, uh, like nitrogen usage, mm -hmm. you know, we're uh, being very diligent about when we put nitrogen on, how much we use. Uh, it, it's uh, the, the science behind that, is, and just in the last five years has increased, mm -hmm. it's unbelievable. Uh, the technology, uh, the GPS technology, I fly mm -hmm. and I have pilot buddies that talk about WASP GPS and how accurate it is, and I says, we can't use that farming because, I mean, you can land a 747 with it, but it's not good, <laughs> it's not good enough to plant corn with. You know, we have to have far more accurate GPS than they use in the Air Force, actually. Mm -hmm. And people don't understand some of the technology we use, so we got a long ways to go as far as educating the public on some of that mm -hmm. stuff. When you hear the term gene-edited crops, what does that mean? And, and where, is that, where is that headed in our state? That's, that's progress, that's innovation, that's okay. technology, that's what yeah. we need, that's sustainability in my yeah. mind. That's um, broccoli. That's but, that's right, broccoli. but it's, it's a, it can be a scary, prickly term. You yes. know? And there's a great example of where, well, you just said it, you know. Uh, we've, been, we've been breeding and changing and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know, cultivating crops and for, for decades Decades and decades and decades, you know, and so this is a very precise way to do that. But there's a great example of where, hey, let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about why a farmer would want to choose technology like that and what it does mean from a sustainability standpoint. Let's talk about nine plus billion people on the planet and what we need to do mm -hmm. to sustainably meet that need. There's a great conversation, but man, you can't fit that into a, a 30 seconds or even just what I can read on my Facebook uh, or, uh, or Twitter you know, account. So that's a challenge is to provide the, the context around some of those things. And as we talk about feeding more people, I think one of the things that we need to continue to talk about is as we grow more food, we need to grow more farmers um, yes. to meet that demand. And like I said earlier, earlier the, the production land in this world is decreasing. I mean, the arable land <laughs> that we can grow crops on is being consumed by other uses too, and, and we're going to have to learn to be more efficient. Right. And I think uh, gene edited or GMO crops are part of the solution. Uh, it, it's just going to be a way of life. It's still amazing to me, though, that Iowa has 30 million acres. I mean, we only lost maybe four or five million over the years. I mean, that sounds like a lot, but 30 million acres, 
being farmed out there right now, that just blows my mind. Right. It really does. We I'm, are so lucky to live right here. Yes, exactly right. And right. thank you to you as well. Yeah, so. thanks to all of you for being a part of the panel, too. We really do appreciate that. Thanks to our panelists for being a part of this Iowa farming discussion. That's it for this week. We'll be here next week for another edition of The Steel Report. We're also online on kwwl.com. Thank you so much for watching.